Okay, this Sunday morning, a lot of snow. Actually, canceled the services this morning, but uh, we decided to go ahead and videotape the messages and put them out there our, so that our members can watch them uh, later. And uh, so today it will be a two part message. In, Open, if you will, in your Bibles with us to the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew, the 13th chapter. And we want to read verse 24 uh, through 30, then 36 through 43, and then 49 through 50. Matthew chapter 13 and beginning reading with verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he say, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then in verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went unto the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And finally, verses 49 and 50. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, we want to bring a message today of concerning tares. Uh, and he says here in verse 38, The tares are the children of the wicked one. The good seed was distinguishable from the tares in that they brought forth fruit. Verse 26. Now this parable followed up the parable of of the sower. And I believe it is uh, kind of an extension of that parable because he goes into it immediately after giving the explanation of the parable of the sower. Um, the parable of the sower kind of set forth the idea of the the, the seed here in that parable was the word of God being preached. And it was referring to the types of hearers, how uh, the receptive of the word of God uh, different people are. And that, that which fell upon good ground uh, was the ones that brought forth fruit. 
Matthew 13, 23 said, They heareth the word and understandeth it. Mark 4, 20 says, Such as hear the word and receiveth it. And Luke 8, 15, In an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. And so we see in that parable the idea, the, the fourth one, that which fell upon good ground are those that were saved as distinguished by uh, they hear the word and they understand it. They hear the word and they received it or believed it. Uh, they, in an honest and good heart, hearing the word, they keep it. As Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And so those that hear the word and are saved bring forth fruit. And that's one of the uh, characteristics, and we will look at this as we go uh, through this, is that that good seed, which in this parable uh, represents the, the children of the kingdom, those that are saved, those as in the first parable, the parable of the sower, that received, that heard the word, they understood it, they received it, they kept it, and they brought forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. But the idea was that they brought forth fruit. Now, we see the Scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 20 through, through 25, it speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. A child of God, someone who is saved, has been quickened and made alive by the Holy Spirit. They are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, the paraclete. Uh, he is our teacher and will guide us into all truth. And that fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, is going to produce fruit in our lives. And that fruit uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, He lists as love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These things are the fruits of the Spirit and will be evidenced in the lives of believers. Now one of the things we see here in, in verse 36 of our text um, not 36, but uh, 23, 26, excuse me, I'll get it right in a minute. In Matthew 13, verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares. Um, as we look at this parable, uh, he said, now let both grow together until the harvest. The harvest, he says, is the end of the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, those that are saved. We see that those that are saved are said to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18 He says here, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So one of the things we see about a child of God, he's going to grow. He's going to grow in grace. He's going to grow in knowledge. Uh, we see that he will be fruitful uh, as in his growth unto the Lord. But the tares, they are the children of the wicked one. Uh, they are lost. And the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3.13, that evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now as both the, the wheat and the tares grow up together, we see the wheat representing the children of God who are going to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And the wicked are going to uh, be wax or grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
And the point is here, a tear was a plant that in its early stages looked just like wheat. It was indistinguishable from the wheat. They did not realize that there were tares until it said the blade had sprung up and it began to bring forth fruit. The difference between the tare and the wheat, the wheat produced fruit, the tare was sterile. It had no fruit or no good fruit uh, as we will uh, identify a little bit later. But it looked just like the wheat. Now when we think about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes, and he was concerned for the church. He says earlier in that chapter, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. So I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, this is verse 3, through his soul, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Well, how was it going to be corrupted? And he talks about if any come and they bring, they preach another Jesus, if they preach another spirit, if you uh, another gospel. And, and then in verse 13, he says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, what's he talking about here? His men, Satan's ministers. Be transformed also as the ministers of righteousness. In other words, Satan has sown these tares, these false believers amongst the saved, the true believers. And for a time, they are indistinguishable from genuine believers. But over a period of time, as believers grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and they begin to bring forth fruit, which the tares cannot produce, then you begin to notice the difference. And that is the point of this parable. Now, a little bit later in Matthew, the 15th chapter, and we've already pointed out from Paul's uh, letter there to the Corinthians that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. His preachers don't come in preaching heresy. They don't begin by preaching heresy. They begin by preaching righteousness. As we said, the, the distinction between the tares and the wheat, they look just alike. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 1, and we want to read down through verse 14. Because uh, while Jesus here is addressing this to the scribes and Pharisees, there is a lesson here to be learned that Jesus then turns around and applies to his disciples to beware of. Then, verse 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. 
and honoreth not his father's mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And so he rebukes them here and gives a specific case where is the commandments of God said that the son was to honor his father and mother and by honoring it means he was to support them in their old age. Uh, if they had a need, he was to supply it. He was to step up. That was his responsibility. But the fathers had come up with this tradition that if he said, well, it's a gift, I'm setting this aside for God, then he doesn't have to give that. Whatever they came said, well, we need $40. Well, I've set this $40 aside as a gift to God, so I can't give it to you. Is, is kind of what they're saying here. And they said that he's free. He's, uh, he's relieved of that obligation. So the tradition of men had set aside the commandment of God. And this was just one example uh, of the attitude of uh, this practice. And so uh, he rebukes them for it. Verse 7 said, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and they honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said to him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Does that sound familiar? I mean, I believe Jesus is making a direct reference back to the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he's bringing that forward and applying it in this situation. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. What did he say would happen uh, to the tares at the end of the world there would be a harvest and the tares would be gathered up and burned with fire verse 14 let them alone they be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind both shall fall into the ditch uh, then answered Peter and said unto him declare unto us this parable and Jesus said are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever goeth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So some spiritual wisdom being set forth here. And he's showing that out of the heart comes forth the fruits of life. The evidences of the life or the lack thereof that are manifested in a person's life. It's what comes forth out of the heart. And those that are defiled... Bring forth evil things. Those that are saved, he said, will bring forth uh, good fruit. Um, them that are lost. Um, 2 Corinthians. Notice he said, blind leaders of the blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, verse 3 through 7. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
So when he's talking about the blind leaders of the blind, he's talking about lost teachers and uh, uh, prophets and so on that are teaching and those that follow them who are also blind, they're both lost. You have lost people leading lost people and so they'll both fall into the ditch. Um, Matthew 13, 14 through 16. In them is full, uh, wherefore speak I to them in parable, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saying, By hearing ye he shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, out of which proceeds the issues of life, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He said, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Anyway, so them that are lost, the God of this world have blinded their minds, which believe not. Uh, 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men and seducers, and the idea of seducing is to lead astray. So evil men... Uh, that are preaching and teaching and a way to seduce people away from the things of God, away from the commandments of God. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus is pointing out that some, uh, or many of you, all the tares will be found among the religious, those professing belief in God, because they were sown amongst the wheat. And that is uh, important for us to understand. These tares were to be found amongst those professing faith in God. Um, they're not in the world just as the wheat was not, uh, they were sown in the world, but in particular, this field represented the kingdom of God uh, where the wheat was sown. This is where the tares. The tares represent false believers uh, sown among believers. That's why it was a tear, because it looked just like the wheat, which was the good seed. I think many of us have made the mistake of thinking of the tares only as the lost, non-professing of the world. However, the tares are the false brethren, false teachers, the wolves in sheep's clothing that are among us. They bear not good fruit, but evil fruit. Matthew chapter 7. Go back. Again in Matthew, but uh, uh, during his Sermon on the Mount, he closes verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets. Now, a prophet is someone who comes proclaiming the Word of God. We see that. In the church, Jesus gave prophets as well as pastors and teachers. That was apostles and prophets and uh, evangelists and preachers and teachers and so on. These were the things that were the offices that was given to the Lord's church to help edify and build up believers. And Jesus is warning His people, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Now why did he say that? Because sheep are used to identify God's believer. Here, you know, in, in the, the parable of the wheat and the tares, wheat is used 
to represent the believers. Here in this particular teaching, he's using sheep to represent the believers, the people of God. And he said, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, in their heart, they are wolves. They're ravening wolves. So wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves disguising themselves as sheep. And so like the parable of the tares. I've seen these cute little pictures. You know, here's a bunch of sheep. And in the middle, you see this wolf's face with the, the sheep's kind of head and, and uh, the skin kind of draped over it. But it's obvious it's a wolf. But in reality, in practice, that's not as noticeable. Ye shall, he says in verse 16, you're not going to know them because they look like a wolf. He says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Now in the parable of the tares, they didn't bring forth fruit. That is, the, the fruits of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit was completely lacking. Here, he's identifying their fruits as their works. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? No, you're not going to get good fruit from uh, thorns and thistles. They the, in the parable of the sower, that was a type of the world and worldly cares and so on and so forth. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Here he's making a distinction. They bring forth fruit, but there's a difference in the type of fruit that they bear. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, these things. Uh, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The same end that was promised to the tares. Every tree, um, uh, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So there will be evidences of these wolves and these tares by their fruits uh, ye shall know them. Um, now back in Matthew 15 Jesus here exposes the corrupt fruit of the scribes and Pharisees. In verse 13, by saying, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Jesus makes a direct reference to the parable in uh, chapter 13, as we pointed out, especially the parable of the wheat and the tares, and identifies the scribes and the Pharisees as examples of tares. Now, they were the religious people. Amongst God's people, the Jewish people at that time, the people of God, these were religious leaders. And as Jesus establishes His church, we are to find these amongst uh, those in His churches. Matthew 7, false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, tares likewise, uh, wheat, uh, look like wheat, and wolves which appear outward uh, to be sheep but by their fruit, the product of their works, evil fruit, them that work iniquity, ye shall know them or identify the wolves, the false teachers, the tares, by their fruit. A corrupt tree produces evil fruit. Now notice in Galatians chapter 5, this is where he, uh, he speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, and he lists the fruits of the Spirit, but before listing the fruits of the Spirit, he lists the works of the flesh. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. And so 
He's making this contrast. And the flesh is identifying with the old man, the unregenerated heart. This is the corrupt tree. This is the evil heart. This is what is inside the wolf. This is what is uh, inside the tear, if you will. The works of the flesh are manifest. That is their, you see them. And that's the thing. By their fruits you shall know them because their fruits will manifest of what sort uh, they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, this is not a complete list, but it lists some of the uh, more common characteristics of the flesh. And some of these things, the idolatry, the hatred, the wrath, the strife, the heresies, the envies, we find these amongst God's people but even some of the others at times. And so uh, when we see these things, we need to understand where is this coming from? And that's why he gives us this list. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we find a, another verses 1 through 5. This know also that in perilous times uh, in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. That is, they look and sound like a believer. He said, but denying the power thereof. That is, the power of God changes us from the inside out. The new birth, the regeneration. It, we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We will produce and manifest the fruits of the Spirit, the good fruits, the good works, which a tear cannot do, which a wolf cannot do. Uh, these, uh, that, that corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. They bring forth evil fruit. And, and these things, they can say they're a believer, they can say all the right things. That's the, the, the point. The, the wolf that comes, he comes into an a independent, sovereign grace, landmark Baptist church saying what? I'm an independent, sovereign grace Baptist preacher. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe church truth. And he can articulate it. You're not going to be able to tell the difference at that. They know the right words. They just cannot produce the right fruit. So when you see the strife and the envy and the uh, boasting, the pride and, and these other things, that needs to be a warning to us. There might be a wolf in the pulpit. There might be a tear in the pew. Uh, this is how you identify them. Um, and many other lists bring the sins and attitude of the world into the church. Romans chapter 1. We see a description of the lost, of the unregenerate. And that's what a tear is. That is what a wolf is. That is what a false prophet, a false teacher is. He's lost fleshly and of the world 
And that is eventually going to come out and be manifested. And so when we read this list in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. And remember, to hate someone without a cause is murder. Deceit or debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. See, that, that one made two lists. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, implacable, unmerciful. This manifests the lost of the world. And as we see these thing, same characteristics more and more in the Lord's churches amongst those who profess to be saved, then let us understand what the problem is. These are not immature Christians. Because he says a good tree, no matter how immature it is, is not going to bring forth evil fruit. And neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. If there's an absence of the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, these other things that he mentions as the fruit of the Spirit, if there's a lack of that and there's a presence of these other things, then beware. There are tares. There are false teachers and prophets. There are wolves amongst us. Jesus in Matthew 15 in our text, points to two ways that the scribes and Pharisees, which are used here and set forth as a type of that which the Father hath not planted, they corrupt the Word of God. Verse 3, he said, by their traditions. And verse 9, by their doctrine. And when Jesus several times warned his disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Leavening was an agent which was introduced into the dough that would agitate and corrupt. And that fermentation process was considered a corruption. Little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It spreads and so he's mentions two things, the hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, and the leaven of the Pharisees, which is their doctrine. And so as we look here in this text, he speaks of their practice and te teaching. Now, since practice proceeds from teaching or belief, what the things that we state that we believe, I want to first of all notice some false doctrine which has been introduced into the Lord's churches. You may say, well, some of these things are not in our church. Uh, but in the beginning, all the churches were the Lord's churches, and we see how that they were corrupted and fell away as false doctrine was introduced. First note this. Satan does not create or make anything new. God only is the creator. Satan can only corrupt that which God has already made or taught. And so that's one of the things that we'll want you to notice and keep in mind. Now notice, as to illustrate this, in Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that calleth you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert 
the gospel of Christ. There's only one gospel. Satan did not create a new gospel, another gospel, per se. But what he did, he took the gospel of Christ and he perverted it. He twisted it. He took something away from it. He added something to it. Uh, and this is what he does. So everything that we see uh, that is taught, uh, the, the traditions, the, the beliefs and all, takes that which God has said and perverts it. And when it's perverted, it becomes something else. It is not the gospel anymore. It is something else. It is a false gospel. And they take the teaching of Christ and, and they pervert it. Then that's another Jesus that they're presenting. It's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. It's not the Son of God. But what Satan has taken that teaching and that belief and has perverted it and twisted it and so on. Notice, if you will, in Romans chapter 1, and as it goes down that list, how many times each, each of those stages, he says it changed something. In Romans chapter 1, verse 23, it says, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto the corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and so on. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. And in verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men and so on. So we see three times here they changed something. They didn't create something new. They took what was there and they changed it. They perverted it. And that's the way Satan does. All false doctrine is a lie and perversion of the truth. It is a contradiction. It's not something new. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And as we look at many of these things, we see that this idea has been around for ages, there's nothing new in the modern false doctrines and traditions of men. They've been around since the fall uh, in the Garden of Eden. And so as we look at that, they changed the glory of God, the very nature and character of God. As one of the things... Now, I've never seen the movie. I have no intention of seeing the movie, but I've read some of the, uh, when it came out, the, the movie Noah, and people got all excited. Oh, they're making a mo movie about the Bible, and, and, and this will encourage people to believe the Bible. No. The guy that made that was a Gnostic. This is from a Gnostic or a heretical point of view. It does not teach what the Bible teaches. If people go and they watch that and they buy into that, they come out with the impression that God is evil and Satan is good. It is a perversion of the very nature and character of God. It doesn't bring any glory to God. Christians need to be aware. Most who profess Christianity today, their understanding of the scripture and the underlying teachings is so shallow. That they're so easily manipulated, so easily deceived uh, by these uh, things. And, and, and it's sad. Those people need to get into the Word, study the Word. Don't, don't let Hollywood be your Sunday school teacher. Go to the Scriptures, search the Scriptures. The glory of God, they changed the glory of God, the very nature and characteristic of God. Now in theology, I'm going to use a, a big word here. And, and actually, somehow I missed it. When I was going to Bible college, I was not in the class that went over this. And I remember sometime later, after I'd graduated from Bible college, somebody that had gone through the college came up to me and asked me, uh, are you a 
infralapsarian or supralapsarian. And I had to look at him and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Never heard those terms before. And so I said, now if you can explain to me what they mean, then I'll tell you uh, whatever. Supralapsarianism. You know, at, at one extreme end, you have the out and out free will. There's some good in man, and, and man is saved by his own works and everything. The other extreme end, which is also in error, is that God decreed everything to the extent that He decreed the fall, He decreed man's sin, and that. Uh, one aspect of the superlapsarian is what is known as positive reprobation. That is, God decreed that you would sin the sins that you do and you go to hell because God decreed from before the foundation that you would spend eternity in hell. That's superlapsarian. Positive reprobation. Infralapsarian basically says... You know, while God took those things into account, that His election, His foreknowledge is always unto salvation. It's never to damnation. That men go to hell because they have sinned, because they willingly chose to sin. And if you look at one of the prime text verse that they use, Romans 9, and he's talking about the vessels, God is able. The potter hath power over the clay. And it says in verse 22, What if God willing to show His wrath and to make His power known endured with much long suffering? Now, you see, the relationship here of God to the vessels of wrath is He endured their sin with much long suffering. Peter gets into that in 2 Peter chapter 3 and about Paul and let us account that the long suffering of God is salvation. It's not damning. It is salvation. God, instead of pouring out His wrath immediately on every sin, He suffers. He's long suffering. He is patient for the sake of those that will believe. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And that word fitted, see, they say, see, God fitted them. No, that's not what that verse says. If you understand, go into the tenses of the language. And it's speaking here in the middle voice. You have passive, you have active, and you have middle voice. Active is that the subject is doing the action. Passive is that the subject is receiving the action. The subject here is the vessels of wrath. The middle voice is that the subject is both acting and receiving. They're doing it to themselves. Now for this to be the positive reprobation where they are fitted by God unto destruction, they would be in the passive tense voice. But that's not what it is. It's in the middle they are fitting themselves unto destruction. This is the condemnation. That men would not repent and believe because their deeds were evil. That's the condemnation is because their deeds were evil. And they're not evil because God decreed that they had to sin. But because they chose to. And so this view of God under the guise of preaching the sovereignty of God, which I do believe in the sovereignty of God. I do believe in predestination and election and those things. But I do not believe that God is the author of sin. God is holy, righteous, and good. And so this undermines, this is satanic attempt to undermine our very perception of the character and nature of God. They changed the glory of God into another image. Likened to man. 
You know, they bring God down to our level in one way or another. This is just, this is a pagan view of God. This is the view of God in the movie Noah, that God is just arbitrarily evil and, and wants Noah to do evil things. To sacrifice one of the children there. And God didn't have, that's not in the Bible. That's not biblical. But that is a view of God. It is a pagan view of God. The idea that God decreed who would go to hell under the guise of preaching the sovereignty of God. So, it's this pagan view that God is in heaven pulling our strings for His own amusement. We sin because God decreed that we would sin, which makes God the originator of sin. No, in Genesis 1.31, it was all the things that He made, and it was all good. It was very good. God did not create sin. This denies the holiness and righteousness and goodness of God. We see Jesus, another aspect where uh, they have changed the glory of God. When God became flesh, when Jesus became man and took upon Himself the uh, robe of flesh, that He could have sinned. He had opportunity to. We said that He is tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And people have taken that, Satan has taken and perverted that idea in saying that Jesus, basically what it says that Jesus lusted, but he didn't act on the lust. Well, if he lusted in his heart, God says that's sin. Because out of the heart proceeds the issues of life. Out of the heart, that's where sin begins. That's where it originates. James defi defines temptation and when he says that when we're tempted, do not say we're tempted of God. Because God cannot be tempted with sin. Neither uh, does not tempt man uh, and neither uh, because he cannot be tempted with sin. Because sin... We're, we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And so there in that definition, when we are tempted, when man is tempted, there's two aspects to it. There is the outward enticement, which is around us constantly, and then there's the inward lust, which is attracted to and drawn to that enticement. And when we act upon that, that is the third and final stage. So every man is tempted when he's, first of all, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Those two go together. And then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. They say, well, he was tempted. He just didn't act on it. No. That's denying the nature of God. Uh, and we refer to that as the impeccability of Christ, that being God, even though He was in the flesh, He did not quit being God. All the Scripture speaks of Him as He was God in the flesh. Thou shalt call His name Emmanuel, which being in turn is God with us. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He is the Creator. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God with us. God Himself. And in Colossians, I believe it is, He talks about in Him that is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was present bodily and God cannot be tempted with sin. God is immutable. Adam was mutable. And so 
when the temptation was placed there, he yielded to that temptation. When the second Adam, he was made a quickening spirit. He is God in the flesh. Well, we see this as a, another perversion, a pagan view of deity making him uh, man, more man than God. Um, another thing we see is that they changed the truth of God. Here we see the inspiration of the Scripture is called into question. 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That is, it is God-breathed. 2 Peter chapter 1, talk about holy men of God. Let, let's turn over there. 2 Peter chapter 1, and follow it on down actually into uh, chapter 2. Verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. And the idea here is that this was not the private thoughts of man, of any man. He says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It, again, this was not of the individual uh, ideas and thoughts in the, from the will of man, but said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It is God breathed. It is, man had no means, if you will, of contaminating the Word of God as they spoke by direct inspiration. We see here in denying the truth of God, the inspiration of the Scripture, a pagan view of sacred texts. That these good men wrote some good thoughts and they're all equally valuable. The idea that the scripture contains errors or is a collection of stories, myths, legends, allegories, and is the work of men is the way some people approach uh, the word of God and treat uh, the word of God. And so we see one of the things that man does is he changes the truth of God. Uh, not just the truth of God. Uh, his existence and of his nature and character, which we touched upon in they changed the glory of God, but even his words. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And so, and in saying this, you know, we do distinguish between the scripture, the original languages in which this was given, when holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and translations of the Scripture. Whether those translations be in English, Latin, Spanish, German, whatever they may be, those are translations. That is why we constantly go back to the original comparing Scripture with Scripture, comparing uh, the Greek and the Hebrew uh, and understand that the Bible notes and references are also, they're even more suspect than translations may be. But the difference between that which was given and the translating that which was given into any other language than that in which it was given, uh, there is a distinction and a difference. But we do have the Word of God. I do believe this is the Word of God. This is an English translation of the Holy Scriptures, which was given, that is the Holy Scriptures, was given by the inspiration of God. 
And we see, thirdly, that they changed nature. They questioned 